and recording has started. Thank you. So in uh, just a few moments, Nicole is going to start presenting. Um, Nicole is from OpenStax. And uh, I just wanted to welcome everybody to this uh, webinar, um, which is partially funded by an Alliance Professional Development Grant. Um, so with that, I will let Nicole get started. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having us here today. My name is Nicole Finkbeiner, and I'm the Associate Director of Institutional Relations at Rice University. And what that means is that my main role here at Rice University and at OpenStax, the free textbook initiative through the university, is to act as a grant-funded consultant, uh, working with institutions to encourage uh, adoptions of OER, not just OpenStax OER, but all OER, and helping institutions through the process of increasing adoptions in the number of students at their school. So I'm going to go ahead and get started, and then after I talk, I will turn it over to my, my wonderful partner in crime, Quill West. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. So the biggest thing that I always tell people when you're looking at how to implement an OER initiative is you've got to be very, very careful about how you measure success. And the important thing here is that you want to measure outcomes, not actions. So you want to measure the number of faculty using OER, the number of students impacted by OER, the amount of savings to students, and then, of course, the long-term goals of student success, grades, completion, retention, things like that. There are a lot of actions that encourage success, but we should not consider them success, and that would be holding meetings, having workshops, things like this. So oftentimes, when I call an institution and I say, how is your OER in implementation strategy going? They'll say, oh, it's going wonderfully. And I'm like, well, tell me about it. And they'll say, well, we held a meeting and we had a workshop and 10 faculty came to the workshop. And, then, and so we'll go through their numbers again and we'll say, and we'll take a look and see, did they get any increases in adoptions? Did they increase the number of students using OER? Because those are the metrics that we really want to look at. So to give you an example, one of the things that we do through our institutional partnership program is we help institutions write a strategic plan. And this is a, a short snippet of a strategic plan that we wrote uh, for one college. And you can see that this college had a, a pretty good increase in the number of students using OER and the amount of savings they had. So over two years, they had 859 students. Uh, who were impacted by OpenStax books. I don't have metrics for all OER for the school, but OpenStax books, and they saved their students about $85,000. That is impressive, and that's something to celebrate. Unfortunately, they have 26,894 students in their school. So in reality, only 2%, 2.5% of their students were impacted by OER. So this gives you an idea of the type of metrics that I look at and I coach institutions on. And by the way, through uh, the strategic plan that we wrote for this institution, now 12.5% of their students are impacted by OER, so much higher. The second thing that I always like to emphasize is that you want to focus on scale. Um, and, and you see this with the OpenStax books. We go after the highest enrolled courses across the country because those are the ones that we know that we can impact the most students. So whenever you hear about different projects and OER opportunities on your campus, the first thing that I would recommend that you always ask is, how many students will be impacted by this? Because especially at the beginning, you want to go after those high numbers of students. That's where you're going to be able to impact a lot of your students. Third, uh, you really want to start with your easy wins that impact students now. So when I work with institutions, uh, there have been some institutions who say, I really, I, I really like that there's OER already out there that we can adopt, but I think my institution would like to start by writing a book. And while we definitely encourage institutions to develop OER and things like that, what I have seen is if that is where an institution starts, they often get stuck. 
because the process of writing an OER textbook can take one to two years. And in those one to two years, their funding is tied up in that book and such, and they're not able to impact any students at all during that time frame. So I always recommend that you start with the easy OER, the ones that are out there from OpenStax, the ones listed in Open Textbook Network, all of these different places, um, and get, encourage your faculty to utilize those because those will be the ones that they can start using right away and start impacting students right away. For your OER initiative, it's really, really important that you designate a single person as your leader. And I really like this phrase that I heard at a leadership academy I went to, which is we equals not me. It's really important that you have one person who is ultimately responsible for the initiative. But at the same time, you want to have that one person that is held responsible, but you want to make sure and include all the different stakeholders in the initiative as well. Faculty, administrators, librarians, instructional support, the bookstore students, you really want to include all of them um, in this initiative and get them all on board. Of course, we're here at Rice University and we report up to a faculty member, so I'm always going to tell you that you need to protect academic freedom uh, during this process as well. It does need to be a choice. A faculty member needs to be able to make the best decisions for their course. There have been some institutions in the past who have tried to force OER and have come up against massive resistance. Um, which they're still fighting to this day. So it's really important that you make sure you protect that academic freedom. So to the meat of the presentation, those are the kind of the bare bones things that you need to do. But here's the thing that I will also tell you is that successful initiatives take several approaches simultaneously. So often I will call a school and they'll say, what, what are you doing for your OER initiative? And they'll name one thing. In reality, what I found is that it's more like this puzzle, in that you have to do each, each part of your initiative is one puzzle piece, and you need to bring a lot of different puzzle pieces together to make it work. Um, so I call these the institutional initiative puzzle pieces. And you know, when I'm working with an institution and writing that strategic plan and such with them, I recommend no less than eight different types of approaches. I won't be able to go through all of them that I recommend today, but I did want to go through a few of them. The first one that I think is really important is express administration, express support from your administration. Now, you definitely do not want to make this a top-down initiative, but you do want these folks on board. And there's a couple reasons for this. Um, most important, I mean, number one, funding, being able to get the funding you need and the, the administrative support you need. Uh, secondly, and this is an interesting thing, but it's a phone call that comes into our offices every once in a while. Every once in a while, a faculty member will call and say, I would really like to switch to open educational resources, but I'm so scared that I'll be punished for doing so because my school makes so much money off the bookstore. Now, if you're in this group, I'm sure you know, your bookstore is not making a ton of money off textbooks. They really aren't. They make less than six cents off the dollar. Where they really make their money is in merchandise. So that's not a real concern, but that is the concern that's out there. So I've mentioned this to different presidents and provosts and encouraged them to do different things to do this. And it's interesting that a couple of them have come back to me and said, you know, Nicole, I went back and I was talking about OER in a group and faculty started raising their hand and saying, is this an initiative of the provost office? Do you support this? And they said, they've been asking me that all along and I didn't realize that's what it means. So it is really important. So one of the things that we do uh, is that we encourage you to have one of your senior administrators write an email, so it's something very concrete, to send out to your faculty and your staff, because instructional designers and um, admin support, everybody plays a role in this. But we really recommend, again, you want to make sure that this is academic freedom friendly when it's written, and I usually write a draft of these for uh, the different senior administrators. But just expressing support and letting them know that this is something that will be supported. And as you can see on the screen right now, 
This is an example from the University of Idaho. Thank you, Annie. Uh, and her, her provost and executive vice president who sent out an email of support uh, for this initiative. So very exciting there. Uh, I have examples from University of Oklahoma, UMass Amherst, a wide variety of schools have done this, and it really does help. The second thing that I will tell you is it's somewhat labor intensive, but so incredibly effective is going and doing presentations at department meetings. And I'm very specific about how to approach this because there is a very specific way to do these. Number one, I recommend you go to their department meetings. And I recommend that because most faculty show up for their department meetings. So you have an audience um, there and you know you'll have an audience there. What I recommend is doing about 20 minutes, giving a talk about OER, and then physically handing them a list of OER that exists for their subject matter. So I know a lot of you have libguides and things like that, and that's fantastic, and yes, definitely you want faculty to use those eventually. But in the meantime, when you're just getting started, the impact is to give them the easiest and quickest way. So if you go to the anatomy and physiology department, you hand them a list of these are the anatomy and physiology OER resources that we know are out there that you could start using today as additional study aids um, in a variety of ways. And then follow that up with the email with the links to those exact resources. Another very effective way, although also somewhat time consuming, is to ask faculty directly to pilot the books. And again, this is a very specific way of doing this, and it goes back to social norms theory. Uh, if you go into that department meeting and you say, okay, now that I've explained this all to you, raise your hand if you're willing to pilot a book for me. Um, I guarantee the answer will be no hands raised <laughs> for most of the time. However, if you go to the department chairs and the senior academic administrators and you say, tell me, who, who are those really innovative faculty in your uh, departments? Who are those ones that are willing to take risks, willing to try something new, are interested in student effectiveness and engagement and student affordability? Get those names from them and then go to that faculty directly. Go to, you know, Professor Mary's office and say, hey, Mary, I heard that you are willing to try new things and that you're a very innovative faculty member. Flattery works. And I, I'm here to ask you if you would be willing to pilot one of these books in, in one of your courses, perhaps your honors course or whatever. The chances that that person will say no at that time are greatly reduced. Uh, so it does work very well. And pilots do work. So at OpenStax, what we have seen over the last couple of years is that a lot of our adoptions were a single faculty member in a department. And in fact, this happened just yesterday at Anne Arundel Community College that we had a single faculty member who piloted our psychology book. And he used it for a couple of semesters, got very used to it, and then went back to the department and said, guys, this is just as good as our other psychology book. We should switch the entire department over to this book. And they did. Uh, so that's what we are seeing is if, a one, if you have one faculty member who's willing to pilot it, then they'll go back and tell about their good experience. You'll be able to get a lot more faculty to be able to use the books, which goes back to our metric of the amount of students that you want to impact. And so we like to call these faculty advocates textbook heroes here at OpenStax. And so you really do want to utilize these folks who are willing to stand up because you and I can tell them all the time about how, you know, these books are great and they'll work really well and such. But when they hear it from a fellow faculty member, that really does help them um, to feel like it's part, it's coming from them and that it's something that they can get behind. So uh, we ask faculty to do this all the time. Um, and faculty do this all the time, even without us knowing. We will find out about presentations at conferences and such. But you can do this through, you know, writing articles about the faculty member using OER, asking them to give the workshop, asking them to present with you at department meetings and such. So this is an example of an ad that we put in a sociology conference brochure to give you an idea. 
And so this is a sociology professor from Middlesex Community College. She's very well known in the sociology community. And so we put this ad in the newspaper, or the, the conference brochure, and yes, this is actually a quote from her. My students shouldn't have to choose between buying textbooks and buying groceries. And I was at this conference, and faculty were walking up with Benner's ad and saying, yes, I agree. What can I do about this? Tell me more. So the University of Minnesota Open Textbook Network has a, um, a, a, a how do I want to call it, a program where they have this really neat initiative where you can hold faculty workshops for OER on your campus. So the faculty member goes through this workshop, they learn about OER, and then they write a public review of an open educational resource. Usually you as the institution reimburse them a couple hundred dollars for doing this. And what they have found at the Open Textbook Network is that the faculty that go through this process, approximately 40% of them will end up adopting an OER after going through that process. So that can be a very effective way. Grants are probably one of the most popular ways of implementing OER on a campus. And um, I'd really like to point out this very specific model. This is from Affordable Learning Georgia, which is the university system of Georgia's model. And I really like it because it really sets the faculty member up for success and allows the, the group to have the accountability that they need. So number one, they, every faculty member who gets the grant, every team has to send at least one person to an orientation day. So these days usually consist of training on grant administration. Um, I usually fly in and help with implementing the OER part in their classroom. Um, they'll go over the Creative Commons licenses and things. Basically, it is one day where they remove any barriers that might keep a faculty member from being successful with that adoption. Secondly, they require measurable outcomes. So on the grant, they ask, how many students will this impact? How much was the book currently? How much will the new OER transition be? How long do you plan to continue this? You know, very measurable things. And then throughout the grant process, they keep checking on those numbers. Tell us what your numbers were for this semester. How many students did you really impact? How, how much did they really save? Each team is also required to do some form of efficacy study. These can be very simple, such as a student survey, um, or they can be the full-blown compare course grades, compare success rates, add drop rates, things like that. They haven't been real stringent, but you could be. They include those easy wins. So they actually have multiple different uh, grant categories. They have one just for people adopting an OpenStax book um, that you can apply for. They also have another one where they have mapped their top 100 highest enrolled courses, and then OER that they know exists for those courses, and you can get a grant for adopting OER for any of those highly enrolled courses. And then my favorite part of this grant is that they have the, what's called an adoptions at scale, which is kind of going back to the Anne Arundel example earlier, where you have one faculty member in the department who's using the book, but perhaps there's some additional work that needs to be done so that the entire department can use the book. Either, you know, there's additional resources that the adjunct faculty will need, or there needs to be videos created or whatever. And so they have an adoption category that's adoptions at scale, where a faculty member specifically works on ensuring that the entire department will adopt an OER. Getting your students involved is really important as well. Uh, I do not recommend making them the leader of your initiative. Um, the, a lot of schools have tried that and struggled a little bit as students get busy with grades and finals and things like that, or they graduate. Um, I'd love to see them graduate <laughs> when they're in charge of the OER initiative. But I do think they play an absolutely critical role. Uh, a lot of student government associations across the country have written resolutions in support of using OER on campus. Student Perk does a lot. They have research studies out there. They do different campaigns on campuses. And then your student newspaper, if you have one, can be really helpful. Again, going back to University of Idaho, their student newspaper editorial board wrote an editorial article supporting the use of OER. Other student newspapers have featured faculty who have adopted OER in their student newspapers. 
Um, another thing that you could do with the students is have the students get an award each year to a faculty member who has done some sort of affordability student success initiative in their class. Visuals and displays can be very, very helpful uh, when you are using OER. So at OpenStax, uh, we don't really provide comp copies, but when we are at a, um, a conference and such, we always have physical copies of our books there. And that's interesting because our goal is to get, encourage faculty and students to utilize the free versions online, the PDF and the web view and things like that. But what we have found is that having some physical copies for a faculty member to look at really just makes it real for them. Uh, it really helps them to understand that this is a very tangible thing. So sometimes I work conferences and when I, it never fails. Every time I walk up to at least one faculty member and I hand them a physical copy of the book to look at and they crack it open and they go, oh, it's in color. And I'm like, yes, our books are in color, but they assume because they're so inexpensive that they can't possibly be high quality and they can't possibly be color. But when they really get their hands on one and realize that it is actually high quality, um, it changes everything. So this is an example of a display of OpenStax books that was at Humboldt State University's library that really allowed faculty members to uh, get their hands on the book. University of Oklahoma did some really interesting things with a very similar display in that she took it to different faculty events, convocation, breakfast, everything, so that she was bringing the display to the faculty members for them to see. And there's another example of it as well. This one's actually from Oklahoma State University, uh, and he was kind enough to send me this. This was some, a whiteboard he simply put up in a high traffic student faculty area. And you can see the students had some fun with this one. So finally, as I mentioned, uh, we have an institutional partnership program at OpenStax um, where you can work with us one-on-one uh, -on -one to work on a strategic plan for your campus and to implement it. Uh, and we have shown that this works. Again, I would, be, I would be remiss to tell you all that you need to do measures and then not do it myself. So what we see is that if schools follow these strategic plans, they really do see significant increases in the number of students they impact and the increases in adoptions. Um, so our next application period is June 15th and the selected schools will be notified July 1st and then the program will begin July 15th. And I will put a link to all this information in the chat box uh, once I'm done. So at this time, I am going to turn it over to Quill uh, and I believe we are doing questions at the end. So let me find Quill on here and I will turn it over to her next. Hi everyone. Um, <laughs> I am just setting up my screen. Okay. You should be looking at my screen at this point. Um, my name is Celeste, and I'm the Open Education Project Manager at Pierce College. Um, but today, I'm actually going to be talking a lot about information, kind of my experiences in the Open Education Launching Initiative um, at two colleges now, and also on a project called Library as Open Education Leader. Um, and at the risk of everybody heading off to other websites right now. I'm going to put the link to Library as Leader um, in the chat window. Uh, and I'm doing that just because um, it's that way you can follow some of the work we've been doing on this grant. It's, it's an LSTA grant, so it's federal money, and we would very much like it if you can use the resources that we've developed in Washington State. Um, one of the reasons why I'm so interested in being able to talk to librarians about launching open education initiatives is that um, this, for me, I'm a librarian by training. I, I was actually at an Arbus Cascade library while I was um, working my way through library school. And um, I see open education as an opportunity for librarians to join the conversation about what happens in the classroom in a more direct way. Um, as a way to integrate both information literacy but also affordability and access for students. So 
Um, that's kind of where I lead from here. I was looking at the title of today's conversation, and I was thinking about launching open education and what that means. Um, and I just, this, we're going to do this by reflection because um, I may not have access to seeing what you think. But as you're listening today to the concept of launching your open education initiative, I'm hoping that you're thinking about what you're hoping to figure out, um, whether or not you're here just because you heard Nicole was going to speak first and um, in order to ask her questions, you have to wait through my presentation, or um, whether you're really interested in um, what you want to know about today's presentation. I'm going to try to address all the general questions that I've had in my inbox over the last few years, um, but I'm also happy to stay on and keep answering questions. Um, so a launch is a taking off point. It's, it's the place where you move forward. Um, it's that big leap into the unknown for some of us, and it can be really um, quite scary. It was for me the first time. Um, but there are also really dramatic things. There, um, when you launch a movement, you are or launch an initiative or launch a project, you're really making a dramatic statement about what you're trying to do. Uh, and they can be quite beautiful, but they are also complicated. <laughs> Um, a launch is not the thing, the place where you do your planning. You do, um, before you can launch an initiative, you really have to do the planning behind the initiative. So I'm going to talk in terms of planning today and how um, kind of I've formed my thoughts around planning. Um, and I want to point out one of the things that I think is really important about launching any plan is that or any um, open education project is that they have to be fairly movable and you have to know that um, no one can really tell you exactly what to do at your institution to launch your initiative because your institution is very different culturally than every other institution. In some ways, your culture, your culture is going to be different. Um, and so there are pieces of other people's projects that I use all the time because they work really well for me. And then there are pieces of projects that I have tried at an institution and they didn't work. And like the institution I work for right now, Pierce College, is 10 miles away from the institution that I worked at for my last open education initiative. The project here is totally different than the project that we launched at Tacoma Community College. We have similar goals. But they're very different just based on the difference in communicating with faculty and the difference in um, initiatives to meet, meet our core goals at Pierce College. So we've had to change, I've had to change my approach to open education just based on the institution itself. Um, so <laughs> there's some different things I want to say about planning and I think it's really important to kind of think about yourself and where you get your ideas on open education and on planning. Um, so you'll see here that there, like <laughs> on the on the um, one side of this screen, there's that little 4-H sign. I was a 4-H'er from the time I was like, I don't know, five years old. Um, and a lot of what I understand about planning and a lot of my history with how to build a plan and start a project comes from what I learned there. And I'm pointing that out because planning and, and um, managing projects is also personal. And so you bring a piece of you to that. And it's really important to recognize what piece of yourself you're bringing to your planning process um, and whether or not it's a strength or a weakness. Because there are sometimes, you know, the 4-H process can be very formal. That doesn't always work in higher ed. Um, and then you'll also see some of the key leaders that kind of um, set up my world. You'll also see ACRL. So, so um, <laughs> I got a chance to go to the ACRL immersion um, program track, planning track, um, when I early in my library career. And I would say that if you haven't had a chance to do any of the ACRL kind of program planning opportunities, if you get that, take it and run with it because they do a lot of very good foundational questioning that helps you to get at understanding a planning process that works for your institution or that can work. Um, <laughs> I love this quote from Mike Krieger um, because you're never exactly sure if your plans are going to bear fruit. Um, and so one of the questions that I think is really important um, for me is to understand where I stand within institutional planning. 
um, what does strategic planning look like at your institution, and where do you stand in the in that work? Some schools really integrate their librarians. Um, some schools rely on a librarian that, that um, in my experience, usually the schools that rely on librarians have had somebody, a director, or a really good faculty librarian who just shows up and says, I'm a part of this, whether you've invited me here or not. Um, and there's a culture that allows for that. And eventually, then, the library is always consulted in strategic planning. And then in other places I've been, it's like, oh, yeah, we have to talk about the library and accreditation. Quick, call them and tell them how and ask how they're dealing with strategic planning. So um, it's really diverse, but it's important, I think, to consider your institution's strategic plan. Um, because an open education project needs to be goal-oriented. So you heard Nicole talk about how important it is to measure your successes um, and to define what that measurement is going to look like. For me, it's about setting up that goal so that you can measure your success with it. Um, and how does that goal tie your institutional planning? And can you tie it there? Because that's how you get the support from your administrators. Um, it's also how you can talk about it, frame that conversation with faculty who are reluctant to talk about it um, or who just haven't considered it yet. Um, so um, it's also a lot of schools are in that place where they're like, we're going to fund a couple of these projects. Perfect. That is great. Because if you can tie those successes to something that somebody can write in an accreditation report, then you have just set yourself up for further success in down the road as your project grows. So um, what what I'm always aiming for when I set up our goals is how are we going to write about this in our strategic planning? How am I going to tell my board about it? How am I going to tell my president that we're reaching our central mission? Um, my goals have to relate to my central mission or my project dies. Um, so, much as I was thinking about planning and the, and the types of plans I've seen in open education, um, and there's the, the natural plan. This is the one where you kind of let the faculty take flight. Um, they're going to do a lot of the leading on their own because they're intensely interested in open education and they're invested in it. Um, so, people get to go at their own pace on that. Um, it's much easier to manage, which is great. But um, it's really, really problematic if you're trying to get birds to fly and they don't fly and they're water birds. <laughs> um, so you have to consider that. If you have a goal and they're not interested in launching towards that goal, then this kind of project won't work, the kind where you just say, let's let our really interested faculty lead the way on this. Um, it's very ground up, which is cool. Um, so a response to that that I have seen goes the other way, and then it builds a very, very structured process. Um, and where you're putting in lots of infrastructure. We're going to put in, you know, 12 librarians are going to be a part. Okay, we all wish we had 12 librarians. Come on, it'll be our project. But, you know, we're going to have librarians and instructional designers and special people whose job it is to make sure open education works at our institution. And we're going to pay stipends and we're going to build policy. And those are all great, highly structured um, plans. They work because the structure is there to move people through the process. Um, but most of us don't have a team that can launch our shuttle. <laughs> um, we just don't have um, institutions big enough or the, within our institutions the will to put money behind having four or five people just support open education. Um, so there's this other structure, and this is it looks like a plane, but it's a glider, with, where there's minimal structure. Um, where you build enough structure to keep the person safe, but there's no engine behind it. So the structure is there as support and to um, guide things forward, but um, it really relies on the interest of the people who use it. This is most common um, in the open education field. Uh, usually it's like, okay, yeah, we have someone here who can help you find resources and can help you think about evaluating resources and maybe maybe we have somebody who can help you fix them if the design is not quite right for you um, but we don't have somebody out there saying you know we're going to provide tons of support on editing work for example um, so the problem with that kind of process is that you have to generate the wind because the wind does not generate itself so those gliders can't get off the ground if there's nothing to carry the glider 
Um, so the project at Pierce College is kind of an amalgamation of all of these, and so was the project at, at TCC. So um, I think in terms of um, faculty leadership and the student leadership, for example, those were all ground up. That was all people inspired to do what came naturally to them because they were interested in open education. But learning, course design, student, some of the student leadership all had to have something built around it in order for it to happen. So that's where we had minimal involvement in terms of getting things to a starting place, but then we let them go forward on their own. Um, but we also, at Pierce College, we offer a stipend. It's not a very big stipend. It's $1,500 to adopt an open resource for a new course. Um, so building in that stipend and then assessing the success of those courses and assessing the kind of value of the courses within our institutional framework, that is a big structure <laughs> um, that takes a lot of management. Um, so that's how I like to think in terms of our project. And so um, the, finally, the metaphor that I've arrived at is that we're ballooning at Pierce College. That's our plan. Um, we have a very minimal structure. We're using what already existed at our college in terms of infrastructure. Um, aside from hiring an open education project manager, which is myself, we didn't build any new infrastructure at our college. We're relying on our current professional development, instructional lead, faculty, library faculty. Um, and we're capitalizing folks' interest in that field. Um, so we are heating up the air in the balloon, <laughs> um, and we're capturing it so the balloon will rise, but we didn't build an engine, um, for example. This is, um, this is actually probably the most approachable way to do an open education project in terms of um, a launch like this, because you have an infrastructure at your institution already, and you probably don't have, if you're like most libraries I, I've talked to over the last two years, you don't probably have a lot of um, extra to put behind this. So you're going to have to generate that interest within your own staff. Um, so um, I think a big part of this process for me has been learning about what do we want? What is the dream success rate? Um, and so at, at Pierce College, we did kind of that what is your dream conversation? Um, what In five years, what do we want to have, have happened because of this work? And how does that tie to our institutional goals? And it was seriously, people sat around and dreamed. <laughs> um, and then we got realistic once we had those big dreams. And so I would recommend that. I would say be really ambitious in your dreaming. dreaming. Big ambitious goals are good things. And then look at what you have to bring to that big ambitious goal. Um, so I want to make sure that you know these slides are all available at that link that's on the page there, and I'll also put it in the chat window. Um, in that Library of Open Education Leader page, um, there's a really, really nice um, planning document that we built as part of the institutional planning process for the institutions that participated, so you can go and get that. Um, and you can also see lists of best practices that came out of the first year of the grant. So we're in the second year of the grant process. In the first year, libraries built um, open education plans. And so you can go and see those. And that includes advocacy, but also thinking about what they want their structure to look like. Um, and then I really recommend, as a librarian, if you're looking for people to talk to you about this work, the Spark Open Education Project. Um, Spark has um, this really wonderful group of people who are talking about open education and how it affects their libraries. So I would recommend checking in on that. Um, and then actually I want to point out that one of the things that we always have to go back and remember to be very structured about teaching faculty is about open licensing and how to write attributions so people can find them. So I always try to point out in my presentations where my attribution is. So that people can use them again, but also because every time I talk to faculty, they don't know how to give themselves attribution for the work that they've done in terms of open licensing. So um, one of the quiet structure things I do is always pro provide an attribution. So, and I point it out to people who are going to facilitate this work. <laughs> um, 
So I'd like to go ahead and I'm going to turn off my screen sharing um, so that I can see the chat window. Um, I think, Nicole, let's answer some questions. Sounds good. What questions do you all have? You can either type them in the chat window or you can unmute yourself and talk too. So Jeffrey asks, how to get pilots off the ground when textbook selection is a curricular matter that's decided by the department faculty as a whole? Um, Jeff, one of the things that we've seen work really well with OpenStax is um, if, if you can get the department chair or someone like that on board, it makes it a little bit easier. Uh, it makes it a lot easier, actually. But what we find, and we just had this happen at another uh, college, actually here in Texas, where the faculty members were not ready to switch over to an open educational resource yet, but two faculty members representing two different um, uh, campuses at this big school were given permission to pilot the OpenStax chemistry book as an alternative for the next time that they make their decision. Uh, so we do see that quite often as a really successful way. Um, and I want to follow up on that and just say it's a really good idea also to check Usually when they're doing departmental textbook adoption, they sign some kind of contract with the publisher that they will keep that textbook for a certain period of time. Um, and it's a really good idea to figure out how long that contract is and be sure to be in their offices two quarters before that, that contract runs out. Um, because often what happens, at least my experience with it, with it is, they get to the end of that contract period and they don't have time to do the full department review of a new textbook So because they've kind of forgotten it exists. So somebody signs the contract again and they're stuck with the same textbook for another five years. Um, so faculty really appreciate if you show up and say it kindly, of course, or send your, your um, liaison to that department and just kind of say, hey, I think your textbook is coming. Your, your, textbook evaluation is coming up, can we pop an open resource in there um, just so people have comparison choices? Because sometimes it's as easy as sliding in this, the OpenStax by sociology textbook next to the publisher textbooks they're also looking at with the notice that, hey, this one will be you know, free or super low cost to your students. Take a look. Um, and that often will be enough to move the conversation. Another, a couple other thoughts. I really like that poll. That's really good. Um, <laughs> I, I, one thing that we always say at OpenStax is because our books are free and openly licensed, one of the things that we will tell faculty if they're not ready to transition yet is, would you consider recommending the book as an additional resource, you know, um, for your students to be able to study from? Or if your students are somewhere and they didn't take the book along with them so that they can still study wherever they are on the go or whatever it is. Um, we've had a lot of luck getting faculty members to recommend the book as a supplemental resource. And then within a couple years, uh, when that happens, the students will ask about it and say, hey, this book is really good. Can we just use the free one? Or the faculty member will be asked questions out of that book, which gets them to look at it more. And we've had a lot of luck getting um, a faculty transition over that way. Another thing we'll tell you at OpenStax is if they are negotiating one of those publisher contracts and uh, you can get to them during that time frame, please feel free to mention that, that the department is considering OpenStax or another OER resource because if you do that, uh, we've seen several cases where the publishers have immediately dropped their prices up to 20%. Uh, you of Washington OER Steering Committee, Quill, I'll let you take this one first. What measures are taken to ensure OER on campuses are usable to students who are blind students, who have learning disabilities, and students who have other disabilities? So this conversation um, is a big one for us. And so uh, as you know, the accessibility question has rocketed to number one along a lot of e-learning faculty. Um, and 
all of us really it's it's become our, one of our number one concerns so universal design always plays into the questions you have um, it depends on the the library or the institution and what their support services are around it I will say that in many cases it's easier to prepare a course for universal design if the materials being used are open versus the materials being used being created by a publisher or heavily copyrighted in some way. Um, and that's because um, usage rights say that we have the right to retrofit materials on behalf of students who have documented needs. Um, so we have the right to say we, we want to apply a screen reader to this resource and we have to go back in and add um, and add materials that make it easier for a screen reader to retrofit the material, but pre-planning, we actually don't have those rights right away with published materials. So I can't take something that has been traditionally published that's fully copyrighted and make it accessible to my students uh, just because I want it to be accessible to every student from day one in the course. I have to have a documented need for that. Um, but in an open resource, I can. So I can go back into a material and add, um, add descriptions of pictures and those kinds of things um, or reformulate tables which is a big thing we're dealing with here right now uh, so it's very rare to find something that's already prepared unless the, the unless it was created in the last year and a half or so where we're all really trying to do that um, I and Nicole I'm not aware of OpenStax I know that we we when we adopt an OpenStax book we go back through and make sure that like all tags are on all of the pictures yeah. um, and often that's really easy because it's already done <laughs> yeah yeah we we definitely try to do all that um, OpenStax our uh, website web view version is um, the ABA compliant version of our book um, but interestingly every disabilities office that I've worked with has asked for the PDF and they have a standard form that they send, hi, we have a student with a disability, can you please provide us with the PDF? And they're always so amazed when I write them back and I'm like, you can just download it for free right here. You don't have to ask permission or anything. So like Quill said, you know, having the OER actually helps us because having the ability to go ahead and just take the materials and do what you need to do with them is, is available right away. Uh, there's another question to Annie at UI and others. Did the provost message say anything about OER as works for hire? How have others handling the discussion of OERs as work for hire or not work for hire? Hi, so this Hi. is Annie. So, this um, so at the University of Idaho, before they actually sent this message, there had been an internal conversation happening about intellectual property. And so they've actually already removed all language about works for hire from our uh, faculty handbook. Um, and they, they sort of declare that any materials made in the, the regular process of, of being a faculty member, so articles and books, um, course materials are all copyrighted by that faculty member. And the only things that aren't are materials that are considered uh, university sponsored, um, which is sort of a weird uh, label for that, but it's basically if, if they are directed specifically by the university to create something, then that something is considered um, university property, kind of. Um, so there was, there was no sort of discussion about um, who owned the work in that message, but I think that, um, no, there's no contract, not that I know of anyway. Um, and especially not with the open books, there's no contract. Okay, so uh, Jeff Gayton has a question. I understand focus on high enrollment courses, but how do you balance this with high enrollment courses that don't use expensive textbooks? I'm thinking about high enrolled writing courses versus somewhat lower enrolled courses in science. So, Jeff, I can speak to the OpenStax model of how we decide which textbooks we're going to publish, which is um, a twofold model, which is, you're exactly right. So what we do is we look at the highest enrolled courses um, in the United States, and we have that list, and then we look at 
how expensive are the textbooks in that market? So you're right, there's some high enrolled courses where we see a 30 to $40 uh, textbook, and that, that's not a huge concern to us. What is a concern to us is the $380 statistics book and the $350 uh, physics book, and ironically, the really expensive economics textbooks. So that's what we have done, is looked at that formula as a two-part, and there's other things that go in that and sort of copyright and things like that. So we're developing 25 books uh, by 2017. We're almost done with those. We've got four coming out this year. And uh, um, after that, what we are taking a look at is, is it better to continue on that model, or is it better to, con to and do like one book in each subject, or is it, are we going to have a greater impact by going in depth? So right now, we tend to have one book in each subject, but we are developing an entire math series, all the way from basic college math to calculus. Um, and so we're going to take a look at that and analyze that. I don't have data on that yet, but that is one thing. Another thing we're taking a look at is with the OpenStax books, we are about seven textbooks away from being able to offer an Associate of Arts, an Associate of Science, and an Associate of Business, all with just free OpenStax textbooks. And so that's something else we're taking a look at. Um, Ginny, well, I'll let you take this one first since I took the last one. How do institutions access open access textbook publishing as scholarship for the purpose of tenure and promotion? That is a good question. So, and it's, I can anecdotally answer it because it, at my institution, I work in community colleges. So, um, we focus much more of our tenure and retention promotion on um, on teaching, so there's a lot less pressure in community colleges to publish, for example. Um, however, uh, I asked that question because it's one of the things I'm interested in. I really want open education and an and, 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 um, interest in teaching for with open education to count as high as service to a committee on some of the tenure packet, because I think that's it's just as important in the work it can be just as demanding and sometimes way more demanding than committee work. Um, so we started having that conversation um, and publishing anything in my field works well. I asked um, UMass Amherst this question and they said people don't get any credit for publishing textbooks anyway so we don't ask that question because we're afraid of the answer. Um, so my suggestion would be to look at what level it has at your institution and follow up from that perspective. Like, um, what is the nature of the publication and does that count in tenure packets? And then I would be advocating very heavily for the Oakland publishing being counted the same as long as there's some kind of editorial process that you can actually see and work with. Jenny, I, um, so I have been at, at uh, different teaching and learning conferences. Some of them have nothing to do with open educational resources. And the question has been asked about how do you encourage faculty to use things such as open educational resources and such. And uh, without fail, at least one of them says, I want to be rewarded for it in my promotions and tenure. I want to um, get some sort of benefit for doing that. Um, so even if it's not maybe even the publishing part of it, is there something in the promotion and tenure where you can encourage faculty to say like, yes, I did this and I want this counted as a positive. Uh, I have heard of a couple faculty getting it into their process um, individually, but I haven't seen a, a school do that yet. Ben asks, how do you address online textbooks that have interactive aspects that are difficult to translate into a PDF format? Uh, ben, what OpenStax does is that we hyperlink out to different interactive elements of um, depending on the book. So, for example, our college physics book has FET simulations that you can hyperlink out to. Um, we did have QR codes, but the students weren't using them, so there are links again. Um, it, our biology book has the Howard Hughes Medical Institute videos in it. Our anatomy and physiology book has the University of Michigan micrograph. Sociology has different videos, you know, so that's what we have done, um, and that also gets around any um, uh, copyright or whatever with those. So that's one way to do it. Um, and then we also partner with online homework and courseware providers 
They can do like the interactive labs and the interactive simulations and the online homework interactives and things like that. Sapling Learning has a really cool interactive tool for biology and economics. Uh, Symbio has a great online lab interactivity components as well. So Ben, I'm going to answer this from two perspectives because I'm 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 wondering if you're asking how do you handle those things in terms of getting access to them for students who um, may have accessibility concerns. Um, what we do at Pierce College is I ask the faculty to describe that resource in some way. So they um, oftentimes what they'll do is create a schedule of materials that students have to interact with on the web and describe what those materials do and why they're necessary. Um, and that's partially to help students, because we have a lot of students who are in the military and who might be deployed in the middle of a quarter. And so um, we try very difficult, we try very hard to tell them like, oh, there's a video in this module that takes two minutes, so you have to have access to the web for two minutes, or here's what you're supposed to get out of the video. Because we try not to give them the PDF of a video, because it's not helpful. Um, the other thing we try to do with accessibility is always choose resources that either were designed with accessibility in mind, or that we can easily add things like captions to. So um, we try to fit all of those needs. It's not always perfect, um, and it's still a work in progress in terms of building schedules for all of that online content. But we do try to give students a sense of where that online content happens so that they can plan around things like, I might be able to read the PDF version of this, but I am definitely going to need the web for 15 minutes today. Okay, uh, Linda asks, if, if in OpenStax pre-algebra book, I see a link to XYZ homework, it seems like there might be a fee for that. Is that correct? The third parties have fees. Yes, they do. Uh, so that is a model that we've created. It's an open market model. So what we do with our textbooks is that we partner with a wide variety of different homework and courseware providers, including some publishers, I might add, include, such as Wiley, and now Saplin Learning is owned by Macmillan. So there, there are fees for those, and how that relationship works is that they are separate from us, um, and, and they do charge those student fees to use the homework with the book. You don't have to use the homework with the book, but if you want it, there is a fee. And part of that fee comes back to OpenStax as a mission support fee, which is how we are able to sustain our content and revise our content without uh, charging students for the PDF or web view. So for example, we just published our second revision of a sociology. The nice thing about the open market from a faculty and student standpoint is, number one, it provides a lot of academic freedom. So for example, with our college physics book, we have eight different homework and courseware providers that the faculty member can choose to use with that book if they want to. And that provides them the academic freedom to really choose what they think is going to work best for their course or nothing. They get that choice. The other thing that does is it does provide an open marketing co mark concept, which leads to much lower in pricing. So for example, uh, Pearson's My Math Lab may go for about $120, $160 a student, depending on the school and your negotiation. XYZ homework is $25 a student. So it really does depend, um, but what we see is that they're usually 65% less than a publisher because of that open market system as well. So those are available. A lot of faculty like to use them, but it's most certainly not a requirement. Faculty all the time just use the books for free, and that's totally okay with us. The only thing that we ask is that if you know a faculty utilizing our textbooks, please let us know. Um, our future funding to develop new textbooks, we can sustain and revise the ones we have, but new textbooks must be funded by foundations, and they want to see the number of impact we have. So I'll put my email address in the window. So uh, we just got a note that it's a two-minute warning. So uh, again, thank you so much for having us here today, and thank you to my co-presenter, Quill, for her insight and advice as well.
And I want to follow up also with a thank you so much. Um, I am going to also put my contact information in the chat window. Uh, and don't forget to find us on Spark. Thank you, everyone.